September, Thursday morning, 9 o'clock, Central Standard Time, here in the U.S. of A. My name is Missionary Norman at Kerr. I guess I could get in the screen a little bit better. Let me get in here and make sure things look good so you can see everything. guess I better put that up just a little bit more. All right, okay. I am a Protestant Christian missionary, okay, back again with you today. I'm only talking about you and your spiritual relationship with God. I've been talking about it with folks for about 43 years now. And again, I'm always surprised that when you talk to individuals one-on-one, -on -one, They'll tell you the honest truth sometimes. And the, the question you can ask someone, are you really living for Jesus? And you'll be surprised that most people are not. But yet it's the same people that will go to a place of worship, a church, a building with a cross on the top. I mean, now they don't even want to do that. And it's a, it's a, it's a fake church. And I guess as a Protestant Christian missionary, I've uh, five tours in Asia, seven years in Mexico. This is a hard thing to, to finally come to the conclusion about. That, it's a business. It's a vocation. I job to make money and support people and programs and organizations and irregardless it's about making money whether it's good money bad money so when I as a Protestant Christian missionary when I talk to people and ask them about Jesus. Do you really have a personal relationship with Jesus? Have you really been born again spiritually? Do you feel like your life is really changed and it's all about Jesus? And most people, again, as a Protestant Christian missionary for 43 years, most people on a one-to-one -one basis, they don't have that experience. But in their head, they know 
in a civil society, they need to listen to people that speak pious and holy things. Now, this phenomenon happens worldwide, and it makes no difference what religion it is. They always follow the same types of things. Be good to people, be good to the planet, be good to animals. Okay, it's always the same story. But there's something uh, that is uh, an infection in humanity, in the spirit. In our, <laughs> well, I can't believe I'm going this direction already. But in all humans have a spirit within their selves. Without the spirit, there's no life. And how can I know that? Because the Bible says so. God breathed into Adam the spirit of life. Each of us, if I take, if I was to remove your spirit from your physical body now, and how could I do that? By taking a gun and shooting you right in the head. Your spirit is alive and well. Okay? And this is the whole thing about this thing about being spiritually born again. Your spirit then is, is in a state, and it's either controlled by one or two powers that be in the spiritual realm. Again, how do I know about this? Because the Bible says so. There's one place called heaven the Bible talks about. The second place is hell. This idea that there's some kind of ether land, some kind of paradise, some kind of purgatory halfway through, is just a make-believe story of man. Okay, and how do I know that? Because the Bible doesn't say anything about these make-believe places, heaven or hell. I have been working on something, and I'll show you, since you're right here with me. All right, and this is something uh, I find, as you can see, this is, uh, let me show you here. This is my first attempt at things. All right, I don't know if you can see this. Let me hold it up for But you can see, okay, you can see that, all right. Hi from Minnesota again. Hey, go ice fishing, huh? But anyway, this here, and now welcome, Minnesota. <laughs> all right, I had a friend that went ice fishing a lot up there, all right? I don't know why people want to sit on a chunk of ice. This don't make any sense to me. But anyway, this is a, a chronological uh, order of things in the Bible, all right? So I'm making one, and I'm trying different approaches to it, all right? I'm seeing the line of Cain here, and then the line of Seth. But you know, no matter how good somebody is, they always end up in one particular place. They fall away in sin. You follow the whole, you follow this Bible line story, and it's a, it's a, it's a sorry, depressing story about humanity. You read about Cain and Abel, right? And keep on going on Cain's line. They're just evil too. Read Seth, the third kid that Adam's recorded of having. Of, I don't know how many. But anyway, this Seth, people turn to God, right? Well, you think everything would be good. Well, it just all turns out to be evil. You go on down six, seven generations there. Here comes Noah popping up. And the world's so evil, God floods it all, kills them all. Except Noah and his family. Noah gets out of the boat, gets drunk, have sex with the kids, and boom. Everything's re-corrupted again. Nimrod comes along, going to build a tower. God has to step in and again, confuse the languages. Abraham steps in, and everything goes sideways after Abraham. All right? 
everything is brought into play, blessings and cursings, blessing and cursing, blessing and cursing. And ultimately, what does man choose? Cursings. All right? That's simple as that. Very few people believed all during this time since Genesis 3.15 where God said to Adam that one was coming of the seed of the woman to crush the power of evil. Noah couldn't hang on to it. Right? There were so many that just gave it up. We're talking about ordinary people that couldn't hang in there for Jesus. Now you might be wondering why I'm saying that today. Two 2017, 2,000 years later, 20 generations later, you that are going to listen to this on Periscope, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and off of our website, GodSpokesman.com. Hey, hi there, James. You're wondering if you're going to stay in tune to Jesus in your life. Most of you right now, are not spiritually born again. You're leading your own life, doing what you think is right within your own eyes. So here I am, 43 years in this business of telling people about the way of salvation through Jesus. All right, I don't represent any church. Sir, I have a question, says James. I have a question. All right, James, I'm going to give you the floor. All right, so as a Protestant Christian missionary, I believe only in the Protestant Christian Bible. As the only divine inspired word from God to man, the God-man Jesus is the Savior. When a person is spiritually born again, there's three things going to happen. Number one, if you want to become a Christian, here's what has to happen in your life. And let me tell you something, it's not going to some church. You don't become a Christian by going to a church. You don't become a Christian when someone says, raise your hand, close your eyes, and bow your head if you want Jesus. You don't become a Christian when you recite a sinner's prayer after someone. You don't become a Christian when you go to religious classes. You don't become a Christian because you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You don't become a Christian because you go to a Bible college. You don't become a Christian because your mommy and daddy is. Sir, one of my Muslim friends asked me, Jesus never said, worship me. Okay? And your question is, Jesus is God. All right? I have none. Can you please help me? James. All right, you have no, okay. Look, it's like uh, James. Do you know what, okay, you're an intelligent guy. Oil, mortar oil you put in a car, and water. Can you mix the two together, James? Of course, you cannot mix water and oil together. Your friend who's asking you that question is trying to mix sin and grace. All right? And your friend, if it's really your friend, James, or if it might just be you, James, it is only an unbeliever. And that might be your true intent, James. Here's how you become a Christian, James. Yep, I'm listening, sir. All right. When you want to become a Christian, three things are going to happen. Number one, irregardless of how you've been brought up, no matter what you believe, if you think Mohammed was a good guy, Islam's all right, if you think Roman Catholicism is great, if you think... Being a Protestant Christian's okay if you think being Amish, Mennonite, Baptist, Lutheran, Pentecostal. No matter what, Hindu, Buddhist, if you think it's all all right, it doesn't make any difference. 
The same three things are going to happen when you become spiritually born again. A Christian. Number one, you, and this is going to go to you, James, you and you alone are going to say to God, somewhere, sometime, you're sorry for your rebellious attitude towards him. Number two, you're going to want Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Number three, you're going to turn to the writings of the Protestant Christian Bible, New Testament of Jesus the Apostle and Evangelist. You, James, are going to read those words of Jesus. You, James, will decide. Okay? You, James, will decide if you believe or not. If you want to kick Jesus out of your life, you will, James. The decision to be a Christian rests totally on you. Again, number one, you'll say to God privately, you're sorry for your rebellious attitude towards him. I don't care if you pray five times a day, ten times a day. Read the Bible inside and out. Quote all the Bible. You're going to say to God to become a spiritually born again believer and follower of Jesus. You're sorry for your rebellious attitude towards him. What I'm supposed to give him an answer from the book. <laughs> Look, Jesus said to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength and your neighbor. Jesus said to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, as well as your neighbor. Okay. All right. Jesus over and over states that he's God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. Jesus states, go and baptize. Should I say this to him? James, you are talking about another person. James, let's talk about you. James. <laughs> This is the typical thing, James. All right, James. Jesus said to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor. There's people that do not love God with all their mind, heart, soul, and strength. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. This is James's position. James is using this phony sentence about his friend when the truth is it's James who's really talking. And here's James, what he doesn't understand is that he chose to get on Periscope with me and begins a conversation in deception. Okay. Who is, Jesus makes it clear that the devil is the author of confusion lies, distortion. James begins this conversation with me today in a deception. He's unable to be honest with me about his life, James's life.
Just think about that. How would you like to... Your whole life is a deception. You present yourself as some something else to somebody. That's evil. Hey, hi there. Alina. Taristatina. Uh, I don't know how you say your name. Today... Thursday, the 7th of September, it's uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, or well, it's not 9 o'clock now, it is uh, 9.20 in the morning here in Missouri, in the USA, Missouri is in the center of the U.S., okay, and uh, I am a Protestant Christian missionary, okay, sir, bye, have a great day, James, I'll be looking forward to you when you get enough nerve to be honest and have a, a real conversation, James. <clears throat> I feel sorry for you that your life is a deception. All right? But one day, you will do exactly what I said. You'll do it on this earth, or you'll bow your knee before Jesus, as he said, all will do. All right? In judgment. So don't go there, brother. Don't go there. All right, get right with the Lord while you can, right here, right now. All right, today is Thursday. And I began today talking about why, as a Protestant Christian missionary, that when you honestly talk with individual people, and this is globally, they will admit that they are uh, really, they don't have this full assurance of their salvation. I'm talking about people that say they believe the Bible, say they go to a church, say they're a Christian, think they're a Christian. They'll, they'll tell me things that they still believe they're a sinner. They'll tell me that they are just weak and inferior. Everything you can think, every negative point about their life, when someone's in a private conversation, they'll bring it out. Why they are this or that. I uh, Very few people I have met through the years, 43 years, that actually simply believed what the Bible, New Testament truths of Jesus, the Apostle and Evangelist, actually say. What I found out that a lot of the preacher people you talk to, and this is a sad truth, most of the preachers, pastors, associate pastors, youth leaders, worship leaders, whatever title you give, missionaries, whatever it is, it is a job where they receive money. Okay? And it's always the same. It's about money. You don't pay them, they, they're a no-show. And on one level, there's people now that accept that as a truth. That if you want a good piano player in your church, you should pay someone to do it. If you want someone to operate any kind of equipment in a church service, you need to pay them money. All right? It is a sham thing. Everybody's making money. It's a production over and over and over. What and the simplest way to look at what's really going on is to Look at the people in any given city. All right? You can pick out any church you want. Pentecostal, Charismatic, Baptist, Methodist, United Methodist, Amish, Mennonite. It don't make any difference. And you just go to that church, that building, wherever they're meeting... And then find out what they're actually doing through the week. 
I mean, actually, what are they doing? And you will find that for the majority, it's only about having social welfare programs. Helping the less fortunate. And how? Food, clothing, shelter. And again, food, clothing, shelter. And if you want food, clothing, and shelter from them, a lot of them make you sit there and listen to a sermon that they've all prepared about how sinful and evil the world is and you need to get better. Then they'll give you food, clothing, and shelter after you listen to their spew. It's the same all over the world. If you want to receive, then you're going to have to listen. How terrible everything is and how that you're being blessed because these individuals are doing it. Of course, they'll tell you they don't want any credit, but they want that credit. This proves to them, the people that give you the stuff and the people that donate it, that they're doing something good. Because the only good they can do is something they can actually see with their physical eyes. And that's how people approach going to church and being a Christian. You have to prove it that I'm a Christian. I have to have a church building to go into. I have to be around other humans who say and do what I think I should do and say. And it proves to other people that you are really a Christian because you can actually see other people. You can actually hear other people, hear the same things that you say about your opinions, about what you think or how you think your God should be like. You speak it out loud, you talk it out loud, you hear the words, you see the actions, you see people giving things, money, clothes, whatever. And it proves to you that you indeed are a Christian because you're doing these things. Now, nothing wrong with helping somebody, don't get me wrong. But this is not, this is not what being a Christian is all about. This is totally, what do we got here? End time move join. <laughs> oh, gee. All right. Another religion is coming on. All right. So, today, when a person is spiritually born again, it's a spiritual talk with God you're going to have. It's going to be a one-sided conversation. Okay? You're going to speak to something you can't see. You're going to speak to something you can't hear. It's not going to be repeating something I said to get you to speak to a God who you can't see. It doesn't work like that. You can repeat anything you want after me, and you can try to convince yourself that you're talking to God by repeating what I say. It doesn't work like that. I know people say that all the time. Just say this sinner's prayer. Lord, repeat after me, or repeat after me. Lord, help me. I'm a sinner. I need your salvation. And you, it can go on and on and on. People, it's meaningless. It doesn't get you. It make you feel good because you hear your words being repeated from someone. You hear with your ears somebody else saying something to your senses that you actually hear. So since you can touch and feel and hear something, then it's reality for you. 
when you're spiritually born again, there is no, <clears throat> there is no reality of being spiritually born again. You want to hear that again? Listen up. Your eyes are not going to see anything. Your ears are not going to hear anything. Your mind, your senses are not going to sense anything. All right? I mean, as far as you feeling with your hands. You can't feel anything. You can't see anything. You won't smell anything. You won't hear anything. Why? Because when you're spiritually born again, you are talking to the Spirit of God. This spiritual substance, spiritual substance, God is a spirit. This spiritual substance that man calls God. You are going to have a conversation. You, the human, the physical flesh and blood man talking to a spirit who you can't see. You can't hear. You can't do anything. You can't say, show yourself. Force yourself. No, you can't do anything. You're going to say to this spirit, forgive me for my rebellious life and attitude towards you. You can't see him. You understand? People, they have to see something. See, it doesn't take any faith if you see it. Oh, there's danger there. Ooh, I'm not going that way. Oh, if I, oh, look at that. Doesn't that look nice? I'd like to go there and relax. Oh, look at that uh, dress or, or a suit of clothes or a shirt. Oh, look at that uh, car, boat, motorcycle, whatever. Oh, look at that school. Oh, I'd like to go there. Oh, look at that. He's a doctor, nurse, lawyer, whatever. Oh, I, oh, that, oh, man, I wish I had that. Look at that necklace. Look at that watch. Oh, all those things are senses-driven things. Senses. Senses. Our senses see things. You read things. Oh, I like reading that. That's good. Oh, I don't like reading that. That's not good about me or something you like. Every day it's the same thing. Because man wants proof before his eyes. You'll hear the mockers and scoffers about God all the time say, this is nonsense. This is Santa Claus land. This is make-believe. You can't prove this. You can't prove that. All right? You can't make anything happen. You can't do anything. God's not real. Da, 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 da. And it goes on and on. And in part, they're absolutely correct. You're dealing with a spiritual substance that, that has this power that we we. We, it's like trying to say, hey, I wonder what it's like being in the center of the sun. And can you imagine what it's like to be in the center of the sun? Millions and billions of degrees of heat. and <laughs> We have no idea what it's like. Well, imagine this is God who created that sun. Can you imagine you're going to understand about God? You're going to, he's so far past us. We have no idea. He created us. So how are we going to understand the thing that created us? So the only way that we can understand anything about God is to read about God himself in his son, Jesus, who is God. Within this spiritual substance, we learn from reading the words of Jesus of his relationship to what he, Jesus, called the Father. We learn through Jesus his relationship to the Holy Spirit, which is in this spiritual substance. We learn from reading the New Testament of the Protestant Christian Bible of these three entities within God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
They didn't come from make-believe. They came exactly out of those writings. Before Jesus was made flesh here on this earth, we didn't know about it. We had an idea about it, that there was a plurality about God, because you see it in the first writings of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. But people today in the New Testament time, and that's where we're at, we're in the, we're in the, the last stages of the book of Acts, all right? In the last stages, I mean the next stage to come is going to be the rapture of the church. When that's going to happen, nobody knows yet, all right? Now we're in a dispensation of grace. We've been in this thing for 2,000 years now. But God says, now here's how you're going to come to me. You human, you're going to confess your rebellious, sinful life and ask for forgiveness to me who you can't see. All right? So you're standing there saying, okay, God, you're in, you're here, huh? So I'm going to talk to you. Hmm. I don't think so. So man in a fallen sin state of rebellion will never turn to God because it's like trying to mix water and oil. You can't mix the sinner with God. It's not going to happen. God sent Jesus to save the world. Save the world. Well, how is God going to save this sinner who's in rebellion to him? Water and oil, you can't mix the two together. What does God do? He says, because man is so inferior and in sin and darkness, I'm going to enable him to become spiritually born anew in his life by my love and favor, power and strength called grace. I, the Father, the creator of all that's known, will indulge man with my grace abundantly so that all and each and every human being can say, can come to the Father and say that he is sorry for his sins. You can. You can't do it for your son or daughter, wife or husband, mother or father. That grace enables you and you alone. You are accountable only to yourself. You can't pledge to do it for someone else. You can't get baptized for someone else like them goofy Mormon teachers teach. Isn't it stupid? Roman Catholics telling you, well, if you just pray, people are going to go to another place, a halfway house, and you can pray them on in. You become their savior by praying. It, what, it's a devilish lie, the Roman Catholicism, Mormon, all this goofy talk about being in some other place or being annihilated or don't believe in hell or don't believe in heaven, don't believe there's a God, don't believe whatever. It's evil. But God says, in this evil mess, God's watched this. Now we're going on, what, six, seven thousand years. God's watched man screw it up every time, just about. Do you realize that the world is headed for a great tragedy? We can read about it in, in a prophecies. In the Protestant Christian Bible. It doesn't have to happen, folks. You understand? God sent Jesus to save the world. Why are we hell-bent to go to hell? Why are people still evil, mean, and hateful? Do they have to do that? You talk to people and you say, Why are you doing this? Why? I'm going to do what I want. I don't believe in a God. I believe in this. I believe in that. I'll do what I want. I'll do what I think is right within my own eyes. Man is bent on doing evil, but 
The Bible says that evil is going to overtake man. But it doesn't have to happen. You understand, tragedy can be avoided if people would simply repent and say these words, I'm sorry, God. <laughs> and everything can change. Do you realize Jesus said, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength and your neighbor? Well, guess what would happen if people, if the Christians, right? If they're really a Christian. If they actually did that. But they don't do that. These so-called Christians will pick up a gun or a machete and kill their brother in a heartbeat. This Cain and Abel thing has been going on for millennials. They just can't give it up killing each other. Man has got this sin in them that just drives them to kill, destroy each other over and over. 16th, 17th century Roman Catholics and Protestant, white Roman Catholic, white Protestants, killed each other all in the name of God. Fifth, up to 15 million people. In the name of God. Oh, done. God's against them Protestants. This Roman Catholic church is a great church. It's evil. Roman Catholicism is an evil thing. Protestant Reformation movement is just as evil. They don't believe the Bible. Do you know how many thousand different Christian denominations there are today? Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is writing their own rules and regulations of what they believe and what they don't believe. They could care less about God, the Bible, Jesus, nothing. They don't care about nothing. That's the Protestant Reformation. That's how that worked out, because it started in sin and rebellion. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic adherent. <laughs> Today, to be spiritually born again. You're talking to a spirit. God is not going to prove himself to you that he is. All right? Now, what enables you then to talk to God? What enables you to become a Christian? God's love and favor called grace. His power, strength, love and favor is grace. Grace comes into your rebellious life. You. You. Grace, love and favor from God comes to you. So your heart, this is hard as a rock, stony old heart, gets soft, and all of a sudden you're wanting to find out something about God or Jesus. You hear something on the radio, you see a sign, you overhear a conversation by somebody else, and you're, and you're perked up, bing, bing, bing. Something's going off about God and Jesus in your private life. You're not seeking it out. It's just happening in your life. That's grace. All right. God's power, strength, love, and favor coming to you. And all of a sudden, you're thinking about grace. And now here's where, here's where a lot of people go sideways and miss it. They'll, they'll have a warmness and a, a fuzzy feeling about, oh, I need to, I need, really need to get right with it. I, I need to go to a church. I need to read my Bible. I, I, all right. So what does man do? He goes to a building with a cross on the top. A so-called church. Name anyone you want. It don't make any difference. They all do the same thing. All right? So you, here you are, the old sinner guy, feeling grace on your heart, and you're feeling a little bit sorry about your rotten life. I'm talking about your rotten life of unbelief and doubt towards God. You might be a fine, upstanding citizen, doctor, lawyer, policeman, laborer, electrician, plumber. It doesn't make any difference. It's all the same. All humans are the same. All right, evil. Okay, you got to get regenerated. 
But anyway, you go to the church house, and the old preacher man says, he'll tell you a sad story in a three-point sermon. Number one, he'll tell you some great story in the Old Testament. Number two point, because you got 47 and a half minutes to get this over with. Second point will be some story about some great guy in the Old Testament who trusted and believed God. Third point will be about how sorry you are and that you need to ask Jesus to come in your life, get this strength, and be a holy, holy roller, or a holy man of God, or a holy woman of God, all right? So when the 47 and a half minute mark hits in the church sermon, then bingo, you know what's next? The lights get dim in the church if it's at the night time. If not, he says this to you. If you want to become a Christian now, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. If you want Jesus, slip up your hand. And you hear these guys say, lift it up a little bit higher. If you, I see one over there. I see one over here. It's a joke, right? Slip your hand up a little bit higher. If you want Jesus as your Lord today, raise your hand. And, I, and the guy will say it. I see one hand going up over. I see one in the back there. I see it's like an auction. I got one here, one there, one everywhere. I got I need two. I need two. I need two. It's a joke, right? But these people that got touched by grace, which is a real thing, they slip up their hand. Not too high. You know, they can't be the sinner. You know, then when everybody looking at them, they're a whole sinner. Right? But they'll slip it up. Some will get, you know, like that. You know, some even like this, right? And then a the guy will say up there on the pulpit who's getting paid money to say this every week if he can get somebody to repeat it. Okay, I want you to repeat this sinner's prayer. And they'll, they'll say some sweet words. You'll repeat it. And then they'll say, now you're a Christian. Why don't you come up front and we'll shake your hand. They come up front and shake their hand. Then, okay, you need to come to some religious classes. So you go to a couple of classes. You agree to what the church believes in, pay the church some money, a tithe, what they say, the Old Testament law, paying them some money. <laughs> It's a scam. It's not real. But if for man, he can see, he can hear, he can touch. So his senses says to him, his human senses, hey, I'm in a church. I got a pastor now. I got a church family. Oh, man, I'm civil. I'm doing the right thing. And that's what they think. All right. Man goes out, back to his nine to five job, and soon finds out he's just right back, struggling the same old way, going to the church house now and sitting there saying, yeah, amen, my life is really, sin is terrible. Yeah, I'm just a sinner. People that say that, that they're a sinner, they're inferior, they can never, they miss the mark, they're flawed, whatever they want to say. People that say that have not, they are not spiritually born again people. They are not Christians. They are religionists. <clears throat> over and over and over, I hear this. When you become spiritually born again, grace brings you where you and you alone have this conversation with God. You'll say to God, you're sorry for your rebellious life. You'll want Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And number three, you'll turn to the truths of Jesus, read it, and do it. If you don't agree to those three, you cannot be a Christian. If you join up with the church and, and read all everything what the church believes and you're going to follow that, you're not a Christian. You didn't repent. And you'll find out you'll become a stone-cold religionist. And you see them, they come up on, on all these social media sites all the time. All they can do is quote a verse or two, and that's it. Let grace, if grace is moving in your life today, if you listen to this video, <coughs> if grace is moving in your life, it's moving you to say to God, you're sorry for your sinful life. 
And if that's the case, then you need to follow through. You don't have to go through what you're going through right now the way you think you should or have to go. It makes no difference who you are. The, the greatest deceit that's working in humanity now is education. It's destroying the very fabric of our society, being educated. Education has removed this whole concept about faith in Christ. What it's replaced it with is a humanistic church where people make the rules, regulations, and what they believe. If you believe their way, join that group. If you're an atheist, join that group. If you're a lesbian, join that group. If you're a homosexual, this group. If you're a pedophile, this group. Everything's acceptable. Everything. If you want to be a neo-Nazi, join this group. If you want to be a, a, a liberal or conservative, join this group. It makes no difference. As long as you don't just really get up and kill people. I mean, you can beat them a little bit, not too much. Though. Right? That's today. You got the universities chuck full of people telling you there's no God. There's nothing about it. You can't hear nothing hardly today about being spiritually born again. What you hear about is how to join someone's church. That they got some kind of insight about God, this false teacher Osteen, this Billy and Franklin Graham people. They, they no more know anything about God than a man in the moon. They don't believe the Bible. The Grahams don't. don't. Don't believe all this junk. You got people coming on TV that think they are some kind of religious people. Check them out, people. They don't believe. Believe. They don't believe you need to be spiritually born again to go to heaven. Jesus said you have to be born again. He told Nicodemus. And man, since that day, is trying to belittle the things about God and form a religion. The Jewish nation today rejects the Messiah, Jesus, as the Savior of the world. They put up another form of religion. Roman Catholicism, they don't believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of the world. They believe he's hanging on the cross. Do what the Roman Catholic, this evil, killing machine, the Roman Catholic religion. They are vicious people. You think Islam and ISIS is vicious. You imagine burning people at the stake. I don't know if ISIS has done that one yet, but Roman Catholics did it all the time. You understand? Under the auspices of the church. Evil people, boy. These people, the Roman Catholic, think they're, they're, they're infallible. Giovanni Ferretti in 1870, Pope Pius IX said, Hey, I'm infallible. I can't make a mistake. You, can you imagine if I said that? You'd say, Norman, hello. And then he said, Hey, I want you to pray to the mother of Jesus, Mary. She's a god. She can answer you. Hogwash. Nonsense. But you got people that believe that, all right? They just fall for it because they can see with their senses. This whole idea, I need to touch and see, say the rosary. What a joke. Repeat some stupid prayer over and over and over. It's absolutely ridiculous. It can do nothing for you, but people like it because... They're doing something. Islam forces you to pray five times a day. Forces you to do this, 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 to be an Islamist. That's a branded into you. Roman Catholicism the same way. Why do you think they want to have schools in all these third world countries? They're training, brainwashing children to follow their demonic ways. Roman Catholics, Protestants do the same thing. You don't, when you go to a Christian school, 
you're only being taught what that group of people want their God to be like, not what the Bible says, but their spin on it. Again, I'm going to close. Jesus said to love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. When a person has faith in Christ to become a Christian, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, that it is the gift of God. You can't do it. You can't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a Christian. You can't do it apart from grace. And there's three things to become a Christian. One, you're going to say to God, you're sorry for your rebellious attitude towards him. Number two, you're going to want Jesus as your Lord and Savior of your life. Number three, you're going to repent means to turn to and obey and understand what Jesus said. You will understand what he says. You. You. Not somebody telling you what he thinks it means, but you will read what Jesus says. The things that you understand, you're held accountable for. You don't do it, yet sin. And you can rest assured, a man that's a follower of Jesus is not going to choose sin. He's going to choose Jesus. You hear someone say they're a sinner, you can rest assured they're not spiritually born again. They are what they say, a sinner. Separated from God. I'll see you guys tomorrow, Friday, 9 o'clock Central Standard Time here in the USA.